uh, just after six o'clock in the evening, and I think it's uh, time to kick this event off. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Adam Wilkinson. I'm the director of Edinburgh World Heritage, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here to my home. Um, but more importantly, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, our wonderful guests who are in their homes as well, who we're incredibly grateful to have with us this evening. Um, we're absolutely stunned by the response we've had to this event. We were hoping to get maybe 200, 300 people, which is how many we might get to a major event if we were running one in a physical space in Edinburgh. But the joys of our current situation allow us to expand our horizons. Um, and the good people at Zoom have allowed us to have 500 guests or so this evening. So that's a wonderful response to the start of a series of opportunities, conversations online, which we'll be holding over the coming weeks. Uh, we're going to have these conversations with leading local and national figures to discuss some of the issues that we face as a city, both to, during and after the coronavirus lockdown. Tonight, I'm delighted that we're starting with what Frank Lloyd Wright described as the mother of art, that is architecture. All of our events are free um, during this lockdown period, but we are going to be asking for a donation to help us cover the loss of income we're experiencing during lockdown. Hopefully you'll enjoy some lively and stimulating conversation this evening and on the evenings which follow, as well as a chance to put your questions directly to our guests later on. So let's start off with a little bit of housekeeping. You won't be able to unmute yourselves, um, I'm afraid, during the evening or turn on your cameras. That's the aim of what we're doing anyway, so that we get to focus on our guests this evening. However, we would like to ask, we like to ask our panelists some questions from the floor during the evening. And some of you already sent in questions, which is great. But for those of you who have something on your mind or a reaction which comes up to something you've heard, please use the chat function, um, which will come through to my colleague Barbara, who is moderating uh, the chat, and we will try and uh, bring some of those questions through at different points on the evening. If you're on a desktop, you can access the chat function by hovering over your screen until you see where the meeting control bar pops up and you can then click the chat button. This will open a window on the right hand side of your screen where you can see and send messages to the group or directly to us if you prefer. In terms of doing it on a mobile device, tap the screen to view the meeting controls, press participants and then chat. Now, in terms of technical support, if you are having technical issues, um, let us know in the chat window, please. And my colleague, uh, Rebecca, will do her best to help out with these and accommodate whatever issues you come across. In terms of recording, this evening event is being recorded, so there's the opportunity to catch up on something you missed later or share it with your friends as well, so they can view it later. And we're gonna put this out on our social media channels. Um, so if you can engage with those, that would be great. Those social media channels include Twitter, where we have the handle at Edinburgh WH. And hopefully we can change the slide to put up those other socials as well. Is that going to happen? Now, at this point, I'm going to hand over to Nick Hotham, who is my better looking and glorious, more intellectual co-host but he is also the same age as he reminds us frequently as Brad Pitt so a little bit older than me which makes up those other elements. We're going to swap out the hosting between ourselves across the evening um, so over to you Nick for the next few minutes. Thank you very much Adam. Um, so everyone good evening. Um, greetings from Albany Street in the new town. So the coronavirus outbreak is having a major impact on charities in the UK and around the world quite apart from the terrible human costs the pandemic is causing a significant financial impact which threatens the crucial work of many charities. At Edinburgh World Heritage, fundraising events have had to be cancelled. Um, our World Heritage exhibition and retail operation at the Tron has been closed and important conservation work has had to be postponed. As a result, we do expect to lose an important part of our income this year. And while we will make every effort to cut our cloth according to our size, the reality is that we like others, do face a significant financial shortfall. We are therefore asking our friends and supporters to help us get through this period of uncertainty. 
If you support our conservation and community work in Edinburgh, then please consider becoming one of our supporters tonight. We've made this very easy. You can donate via text. So just text Edinburgh WH with the amount you want to donate to 70450. If you'd like to donate six pounds, for example, which is the cost of a normal member's ticket for one of our events, then text Edinburgh WH, then six to 70450. That's Edinburgh WH, six to 70450. You can also become a member of Edinburgh World Heritage and really support our conservation and engagement work. Um, um, prices start at 30 pounds, 25 pounds for students, we have a varied program of events and tours each year, and you will really make an important contribution to our work. So with that said, let's get on to the evening's activities and back to Adam. Thank you, Nick. Excellent. Um, so let's turn to tonight's theme. The question or the thought is, is, is Edinburgh's architecture at the dawn of a new golden age? Today, our skyline in Edinburgh reveals not only the towers and spires of our renowned World Heritage Site, but also countless cranes and gantries, which signify the biggest building boom the city has seen for many years. In this conversation with leading architects, Rad Bennett, Malcolm Fraser and Richard Murphy, we'll look at how the city is changing and ask whether future generations will look back and call this a golden age. All three of our architects are renowned in their field and well known in Scotland, the UK and abroad. Rab co-founded Bennett's Associates in 1987 with his partner, Denise Bennett, having met when they studied at the Edinburgh Art College in the mid 1970s. They established an Edinburgh studio in 1994 and have split their time between London and Edinburgh ever since. To date, the practice has accrued almost 200 awards including the shortlisting for the Royal Institute of British Architects Stirling Prize three times and UK Architect of the Year on four occasions. The practice's portfolio includes theatres, higher education, offices and conservation projects. Since the early 1990s, RAP has pioneered the link between sustainable design and high quality architecture and is a founder of the UK Green Building Council. RAP often contributes to publications, lectures and seminars exploring design, construction and sustainability initiatives. Rab additionally advises on architectural procurement, design competitions and construction industry research projects. Rab chairs the Sadler's Wells Foundation and in 2003 was awarded an OBE for services to architecture. Projects you may be familiar with of his include the Informatics Forum and Bay Centre for Edinburgh University, the refurbishment of the King's Theatre, which is about to go in for planning consents, and the Edinburgh Futures Institute, which is currently on site. Nick. Malcolm founded his architectural practice, Malcolm Fraser Architects, in 1993, which became celebrated for award-winning work spanning from conservation, the arts and commerce, to advising and empowering communities. Malcolm also established a reputation for designing award-winning homes, and placemaking for clients ranging from individuals to housing associations and councils. The practice is working compass conservation and new build, often in historic contexts, such as Edinburgh's World Heritage Site, based on respect for the historic context and the need to build within it in a rooted, confident, contemporary manner. Its Edinburgh Centre for Carbon Innovation for the University of Edinburgh became the first listed building to achieve BREAM Outstanding Award. The practice won eight Royal Institute of British Architects awards and also completed master planning and construction work for volume house builders that won for the first time in Scotland major awards. Malcolm's new practice, Fraser Livingston Architects, was set up in 2019, co-founded with former colleague Robin Livingston. Projects you may be familiar with, Dance Base in the Grass Market, which was shortlisted for the Stirling Prize, and received the Doolan Award in 2002, the Scottish Storytelling Centre on the Raw Mile, and the Leith Fort Colonies. Now, Richard. Richard founded Richard Murphy Architects in 1991, which has since gone on to win 24 RIBA, Royal Institute of British Architecture Awards, more than any other practice in Scotland. Awards range across many types of buildings, including education, the performing and visual arts, healthcare, housing, an office, hotel, individual homes, two British embassies, 
and in doing so they demonstrate the high standards of the practice in terms of design but also its versatility. The practice has also won many architecture competitions. In 2017 the practice won the Doolan Prize for the best building in Scotland for their new Dunfermline Arts Centre and simultaneously the best building in Ireland for their O'Donoghue Centre for the Performing Arts at the National University of Ireland, Galway. Richard also designed his own contemporary house, which I think he's in the garden of right now, within the World Heritage Site of Newtown of Edinburgh, a highly innovative structure, which is also incredibly energy efficient. It won the RIBA UK House of the Year competition in 2016, has been seen by many on Channel 4. Richard is the design leader in the practice for all projects. Current work includes the new Edinburgh Film House, both new building house, both new build housing at and the residential conversion of the Grade A listed Donaldson School in Edinburgh, as well as work for Trinity College Dublin. Waiting in the wings are his proposals to convert the Royal High School on Regent Road into a residential street for, St. sorry, residential school for St Mary's Music School. Richard's work has been extensively reviewed in the press and he himself frequently contributes to architectural journals. He is an academic authority on the work of the Italian architect Carlo Scarpa and has recently published an extensive volume on Scarpa's Castle Vecchio Museum in Verona, reviewed by Robert Mercata in the RIBA journal as a true masterpiece among the most comprehensive and insightful single building monographs ever published. I had a look earlier on Abe Books and Richard, you'll be pleased to know it's now selling for £229 for a copy of your book. I better get saving. He continues to lecture widely on both Scarpa and on his own work, both at home and abroad. Projects you may be familiar with include Maggie's at Edinburgh, a housing in the old fish market close, and his own remarkable house in Hart Street. So, on to the main part of the evening. At this point I have the pleasure of firing out the first question, just a little warmer to get the conversation underway. So as senior architects who have practiced in the city and further afield for many years, was there ever a golden age of architecture in Edinburgh and when was it? And I'm going to ask uh, Richard to give us his thoughts on that first. Well, I'm not a historian, I'm an architect, so I get nervous about that sort of question. Um, having said that, when I first arrived in Edinburgh as a postgraduate in 1978, there was um, uh, somebody once said, you know, what's the difference between Edinburgh and Glasgow? And, um, and the answer came out, uh, Edinburgh is an amazing city with no interesting buildings. And Glasgow is a very straightforward city with some amazing buildings. And of course, that's a ridiculous generalization, but there is a grain of truth in it in many ways. And I tend to think that the golden age of Edinburgh in the sort of 1830s, 40s, 50s was really more about planning than it was about architecture. There aren't any world beating, uh, there aren't any Macintosh schools of art when there aren't in Glasgow anymore, but there aren't any of those sort of uh, extraordinary buildings here in Edinburgh, that, but there is an amazing idea about a city. And uh, so that is my that is my candidate, if you like. Excellent, thank you. I love that idea, um, Malcolm. What I love about Edinburgh is that it's a succession of a, a collage of golden ages: medieval old town, Georgian new, civic Victorian city woven in and around it. My favourite's the medieval old town. I love its flexibility and its adaptability. It allows change within it and. If I can go for a golden moment, I love right now, um, this time of year, walking down the Cannon Gate and it's enclosed and shut in. And halfway down, suddenly, Chessel's Court opens up on the right and you see the blossom in the trees and you see into the court. That's a modernist design on Pilates about modern thinking of letting light and air in, but respecting the medieval courts, rebuilding the medieval and uh, um, Renaissance tenements within it putting Scandinavian modern buildings beside them. So uh, a, a microcosm in itself, a little collage of these different uh, ages of building. And that's a kind of golden moment within my golden age in the old town. I think what's fascinating about that choice is that Robert Hurd, the architect responsible for much of the work on the Cannon Gate, was equally a conservationist as any other kind of architect as well, getting away mm -hmm. from this more recent division uh, between those who have traditional approach to architecture and those with a more modern approach. 
Rab, what about yourself? Well, well, obviously the late 18th century, 19th century was a phenomenal period. And the, the circumstances that brought it about were quite extraordinary. There was leadership, which we might come back to later on, I hope. Yep. There was increase in wealth, there was land available, there was an explosion of ideas. So it was no surprise that it was a remarkable era. But what followed that was interesting too, because of course people were starting to become critical in the 19th century about the internationalism of classical architecture, the Greek revival and so on, and couldn't we do something a little bit more Scottish, just Scotch baronial started to arrive in the mid 19th century. And of course, I, I, my flat is in Quartermar and I can look across at Marchmont at the end of that period and think, my goodness, the confidence that it took to do a huge development like that at the end of that period must have been extraordinary. And yeah. we struggled to get back to those levels of confidence today. And I'm sure we'll touch on that later on. Yeah, so yeah. yes, there were several golden ages, as Markham said. And I think uh, there are pockets of golden ages in the 20th century too, but nothing quite on the, on the scale of those two. Yeah, can, uh, I just, can I just butt in there? Because uh, from, our, from our membership, we have a lot of interest in neoclassical architecture in Edinburgh. So I'm, I'm wondering if there's something specific that resonates with Scots and, and with the residents of Edinburgh with neoclassicism and Greek revival. Is there something particularly strong about that period that, that resonates today or is it, is it, what's the legacy of it? Is it, is it a hindrance or is it, is it a straitjacket? Anyone? I think, I think in uncertain times we seek grand orders and strong leaders. I am not a neoclassicist myself, but uh, you can see the attraction. So I'm suggesting there is an attraction if we lack other ways of looking at the world to look at big columns and rigid street frontages and think that's what the thing is to admire. I look for other things personally. Anyone else? Well, I think um, ideas at the same time. So it's no surprise it had a competent architecture to go with it. But I think I was interested in the reaction against it because if you look at our own architecture today, you could say it's globalized, it's ubiquitous, you get the same buildings all over the world. And to some extent, classicism is rather the same. And so is it something we can do better now by trying to be more regional or is it actually all right that it's a worldwide style? Right. I think classicism uh, lends itself to uh, what, we, what architects were trying to do in the new town, which was not to build buildings, but to build entire streets as palaces and, and squares and circuses and whatnot. It, it lends itself extremely well uh, to that. Whether we have great neoclassical architecture in Edinburgh is, is debatable. I and mean, we have the Royal High School, of course, which had an enormous effect around the world. But if you're looking at neoclassical architects, I think, again, I have to bang the drum for Glasgow. I think there's anyone who can hold a candle to Greek Thompson. Uh, and uh, we have to just accept that. But it's, uh, it, it suited the Edinburgh Newtown extremely well that it adopted a classical approach. Right, everyone, please send us your comments, send us your questions on these topics and others. Um, just uh, put those into the chat column and we'll, we'll get to them in a, in a little time. But, but meanwhile, back to Adam. Absolutely. So touching on Malcolm's point from earlier, <clears throat> and also um, Rab's as well, I suppose, to some extent, if we look at our, our recent past, what, what do you see as being the architectural lessons from the last 60 or 70 years in Edinburgh? Uh, where we saw Basil Spencer's interventions in the city in the form of the St. James Centre, but also we've seen some sort of lighter interventions as well by, by, by yourselves. Um, how do you think people will regard the last 60 or 70 years in, in the future? Um, I'm going to fire that one off to, uh, to, to Rab first. Well, it's, it's a long period you're describing. And, you know, I, I'm in my 60s now. So, I, of course, I was growing up as a kid watching some of the stuff get built thinking the flats at Site Hill, for example, were absolutely awful. And I vowed never to do anything quite like that. Uh, more recently, I would say in the last 20 or 30 years, architects have changed quite a lot. And I think we're now doing work in our mature years, if you like, which is much, much better for urbanism, very unlike the 60s and so on. Yet you still get people saying, you are the architects who wrecked cities in the 1960s. And I think I keep referring back to a previous generation and hoping that'll work. But the fact is, it's, it's not going to be highly regarded as an area. There were individual good buildings of certain types, and Markham's referred to one or two of them. Um, but I'm glad we're in the era we are now, where things are a little bit more confident, they're much more conscious of context, and so on. So, I'm, Malcolm, I don't know if you feel the same, or if you'd like to expand more. Hmm. I mean, it, it, it just to me, it feels like there's a degree of stigma you pointed out there about architects. Do you feel that architects do suffer from a degree of stigma? 
It's, ever since I started out, uh, there's been a defensive argument in place as to justify what you do, make sure that it's uh, something that has logic behind it and so on. I mean, when I started up the practice, it was 1987, just after Prince Charles had done his famous speech in London. And you just about couldn't get a planning consent unless you dressed it up with a classical style of some kind, because the councillors were ingratiating themselves with the prince and so on. That was a really difficult period. So to come through that with some solid ideas that were longer lasting is actually where this current generation is. And I think, I'm glad I look back at those that you wrote, that you wrote. I think it's, it's past. Yeah. Richard, back to those questions of the lessons from the last, uh, the last generation or so. Well, yeah. What about you on that? Uh, well, I think um, the, the pendulum has swung rather violently in Edinburgh in the sense that in the 60s and maybe the 70s, it was uh, uh, some, ter some terrible things happened here. There's no question about it in the city centre and on the edge of the city. Uh, and uh, why that happened, I can't answer that question. The problem in a way in the late 70s throughout Britain and I think in extremis in Edinburgh, there was a sort of complete collapse of confidence in architecture and architects, and we became a branch of the criminal classes, the people who'd spoilt everything, basically. And this terrible sort of, um, uh, you can't do, I remember once, I don't know if you remember, Oliver Bart, who used to run the Coburn Association, he was a wonderful man, and he once said when the building on Castle Terrace is finished that Edinburgh would shortly be finished. And there was this idea that somehow a building could be complete and finished and by some strange quirk of the English language finish means two things it means dead uh, and it almost means complete and obviously a city that is complete is dead and so we have to find ways of the city continuing and yet not um, disrupting what we enjoy about history and that's that is the big debate in Edinburgh and I find it it, it goes back the pendulum swings backwards and forwards if you want my honest opinion at the moment I think the pendulum has swung back so that it's much, much more difficult now to get new architecture um, uh, past the planning committee. And there's a sort of general conservatism uh, abroad again. That's just my experience. It may be other people have completely different experiences. But I would like to think that we have sometime a city about Edinburgh, which is very much about trying to see where it's going to be in the future rather than simply just merely staying still. And, and that's something that I'm constantly trying to promote. Good, thank you, thank you. Malcolm, do you want to um, react to both those previous points as well as having a look at that question about those lessons from the past? I take a different view. I think we are still part of an industry whose economic model is based on a cycle of landfill and destruction and building a new um, you probably need to look at the sort of rules around VAT, where you repair a building, you repair a home, you're charged 20%, you knock it down and build a new one, it's zero VATed. The economy is set on that sort of economic model and all our mini levers align with that. So you get situations in Edinburgh, all over Scotland, where wonderful old Victorian schools set in the middle of their catchment areas with huge windows uh, to let light in for pupils to study better in um, and with fabric that lasts for hundreds of years are closed down, tinned up, knocked down, turned into executive homes if they're in the right postal district and uh, we move our pupils into shoddy buildings whose walls fall down. Um, we are not valuing the world enough. One of the lessons, if we talk about the lessons, is that we, we need to learn as a world there is a limit to this culture of obsolescence. We need to care and repair our existing cities, homes and buildings before we put new diddy box suburbs out, uh, out, out from our towns. And we're still, we still don't have the levers in place to allow um, uh, um, economies to innovate and local authorities to innovate in that direction. So I don't, I don't see a pendulum going back and forward immediately. I see there still being a, a tendency towards, uh, against care and repair and respect for the past and towards a landfill cycle of development. I, I think those are in, incredibly pertinent points and, um, and, and really, really strong ones in terms of that lesson about how much architecture is driven by the economic model that we live in. 
um, and, and the challenge of how we try and break that as a city or find some way through it around those questions of leadership, which Rav brought up earlier. I think that leads nicely into, into the question that Nick has for you as the last of the warm up questions. Nick? Yes, a little bit more warm up. So just thinking a bit further afield um, and to places we've, we've visited and experienced and enjoyed, what, what cities around Europe or in the US, around the world, do you think have got it right over this period? And maybe we could start with um, Malcolm. Well, uh, a, a lot of European cities have had the economic levers and I will keep returning to the economic situation because we as architects are pushed down avenues that we, we, we can't help by the way that the economy is, is set out. So in Edinburgh, we tried to develop the docks and they still remain empty 20, 30 years later because land was privatised, hope valueized, and sites became undevelopable. In, a, in German cities, for instance, they have the economic levers for councils to buy land at existing use value and get the value out the rise of that land. So Hamburg docks has been developed. All over Europe, development has been public interest led in a way that our uh, Anglo-centric economy does, will not accept we can do. We need to return to the public interest. The other place I would use as a particular example of what's got it right. Last year, my family was in Bologna and in Edinburgh, we're congratulating ourselves for shutting down two or three roads one Sunday every month. And that's great, that's a start. But in Bologna, they shut down the whole city, two cars, the whole weekend, every weekend. And obviously COVID time, this won't be happening, but when we return to a culture where we can be together, the place is absolutely hoaching. The shops are making tons of money. People are enjoying themselves. They're walking together, they're embracing friends, they're listening to the birdies sing. So German economic models, continental economic models, and uh, thoughts about car-free cities right. are the two things we should learn. And I, th I think we've all had good experiences of Italian cities, especially historic cities. Rab, what, what were your thoughts on that? Well, I was thinking of Amsterdam. Uh, I mean, there are many cities in Europe that you could point to who've got things like architecture centers to get the level of design culture up. And I'll come back to that later on, but Amsterdam is a particularly interesting one. Um, I did a big hotel in Amsterdam. You know, it was finished about 10 years ago. And if you come out of the main station facing the town and turn sharp left, it's the first building you come to. It's really, it's quite a big one. And it's next to a huge development, with, which has got a small conservatory, a conservatoire of it. It's got a public library, it's got shops, it's got offices, it's got flats. Now, the thing that we found there was you had to not only get planning consent, which meant persuading a planning committee, you had to present your schemes to a thing which was actually called the beauty committee. So you actually turned up with your conceptual sketches, no more than that. And there was a dialogue started then, there was a revised proposal, there was another dialogue, there was another revision, there was, and so the scheme got better and better and better. When you, every time we came out of that meeting, you felt good about it. There was a, such a sense of it going in a positive direction, backed by quite um, sensitive city interventions. So if you go to Amsterdam now, you'll find really good schemes all over the town. There's housing, big scale, small scale, self-build, there's public buildings. The, the development I'm talking about was actually led by a German developer. Uh, so it's not exclusively public sector, um, but it's a fantastic city. And it's got a similar historic and tourism issue that we've got here in Edinburgh, right. and it somehow survived. Richard, turning to you on this one, I mean, the, these are your continental yeah. European examples. It doesn't sound very good for the UK. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I was going to mention one on the continent and one in the UK, actually. Uh, my continental example is Copenhagen uh, for two reasons. One is they, uh, like Malcolm was saying, they've managed to pedestrianize virtually the whole of the city, but for seven days a week. And in fact, Jan Gale, who is a major proponent of all that, has been here and lectured many times in Edinburgh. And the last time he lectured here, he basically said, I've been coming to Edinburgh for 35 years and you've managed to, in that period, we've completely pedestrianized the entire center of Copenhagen. And you, Edinburgh Council, have managed to pedestrianize 250 yards on the Royal Mile, which is not very clever, really. So and also they've got um, great examples of 20th century architecture in Copenhagen, of Arne Jakobsen and Jörn Utzen, and they, they see contemporary architecture as part of their heritage. And I think that's very important. And I would like to think that uh, the good folk of Edinburgh might uh, think along the same lines. In the UK, I mean, uh, the, the town I left when I was 18 years old was a sad town called Manchester. 
And when the IRA bomb went off in Manchester afterwards, they had a census and discovered there were 87 people living in Manchester, and it was deserted at night. And there was a great chief executive appointed, and he really got the place going. And But they, the point being, they were hungry for change and to self-improve and to have a, a, a sort of serious incentive to make a better Manchester. And they have. I mean, there's a lot of things not good about Manchester. Of course there are, but they have. The, it's an, when I go back to Manchester, which is very rare, it's, it's unrecognisable from the town that I left when I was 18. And I'd like to think that Edinburgh would have that hunger for the future, that hunger to do better, to have new things, to take risks, so that people come to Edinburgh not just for the history, but they also come here for contemporary things as well. Thank you. Adam? Fabulous. Um, my memories of a child of going into Manchester and driving through bombed out parts of the city to a bombed yeah. out centre. Uh, uh, extraordinary transformation under Bernstein there. So in terms of the main question of the night, we're now looking at a, a period of massive growth and change in Edinburgh um, with a huge number of projects on site and in planning as well. Um, we can obviously, obvious ones such as the St. James Centre's going up, the continuing work on uh, the Colton Gate um, and other sites around the city, Haymarket as well. Are we at the dawn of a, of a new golden age? It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a serious question. We have a lot of architects practicing from different places um, behind these schemes. We have the large and the small. We have a massive amount going on. And I, we would love to get your view on this. I'm going to start off with Rab. Well, I think the way you phrased the um, invitation for the night is, are we at the dawn of the golden age? I, would, I yeah. wonder if you really meant we're in the darkest hour before the dawn. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, putting that at one side, I, having, you know, grown up in Edinburgh, I mean, I see the changes now are generally positive. It's a much better place than it was. And some of the things that have disappeared are really beneficial, like the old St. James's Centre, which was an absolutely shocking development and so on. And so maybe we should be looking at the question by looking into the future and saying, well, why shouldn't it be a golden age? You know, we've got so much scope for it to be better still. There are lots of developments going on and it'd be good to explore what would it take to make this future development a, a golden age. It's not quite there at the moment, but surely it should be. So leadership from various places, it could be leadership by architects, it could be leadership by the council, it could be living leaders like Lord Provost George Drummond back in the days of the original Newtown, of course. It could be developers and others getting together. There needs to be some kind of forum that makes this change happen to make it world-class and aim for the golden age. And there is no forum like that at the moment. It's one reason why I've proposed an architecture for center, architecture center for Edinburgh, but the fact is if there was a consensus about the way the city was going, it might well turn into a golden age. I, I, that question of city leadership is, is such a critical one and one which, looking back at your examples, which were given up by all three architects of the different cities, leadership has been critical in all of those, uh, whether it's in conservation or development or some forms of change, but strong leadership has been a an important factor has been political leadership as well, with systems that allow for that. Um, turn that question to, to Malcolm. I thought the question was quite ludicrous, I'm afraid. Excellent. Um, <laughs> there are good things happening in the city and the, the, I need to recognise the council's commitment to trying to finance and build social housing, exceptionally important and to humanise some streets, albeit that needs to be massively expanded. And they are trying to do that. And the university's commitment to uh, student quarters, learning quarters, those sorts of things. But um, I'll just read a quote from the, the most incisive architectural critic, Owen Hatherley, on new development in Edinburgh. Shameful on the city with an architectural legacy like this. In any city, this would be a scandal, let alone one as rich as this, with architects as talented in a capital that has not exactly been short of investment. Now, if you look through Skyscraper City uh, site has got the best overall um, tracking of all the developments in Edinburgh. And I would say, if you look at what's on there compared to what Owen's talking about, it's a little better, but it's absolutely massively ludicrously short of being a golden age that's on its way. And we have a massive change that we need to make to try and raise, raise that quality and try and justify the fantastic city we live in and honor it by what we do now. 
both you and Rab have indicated that there is more that can be done, both in different degrees in different ways, and that there are changes that can be made. We'll come back to what those changes might look like in a minute, but Richard, where would you take it from here then? I assume you're still asking me the same question about are we on the edge of a golden age? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, and, and where are we taking uh, it? No, not. Uh, I don't think you should confuse quantity with quality. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the good news is, I suppose, in the last, uh, what, 20 years, 25 years, is economically Edinburgh has been a success story by and large. It certainly attracted an enormous amount of investment and white collar jobs in particular. And the university is uh, on a roll and, uh, you know, there are a lot of people who want to come and live in Edinburgh. It's always, Edinburgh always scores the highest in the UK as the most desirable city in which to live, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So all that is good news. Now, the problem is that I, I learned a lesson a long time ago is you can't do good buildings without a good client. And I would expand that by saying you can't do good cities without good leadership, as you mentioned before. And that leadership is either political or it's at the head of the planning department. And I don't think we have either at the moment, actually, to be honest. We have, um, it was quite interesting, when David Chipperfield came to lecture here, he made a comment about the British planning system, which I thought was incredibly perceptive. In Germany, he says, planners plan. In Edinburgh, in, in Britain, they don't plan at all. They just try and control. In fact, they don't even call it planning. They call it, they call it development control, he said. A bit like pest control, that's a sort of mentality. <laughs> and uh, we, we lack clear uh, forward-thinking planning and leadership and ambition in the public sector in particular, and that's linked, of course, to our catastrophic procurement system of how we procure hospitals and schools and all public buildings. But we also need private clients as well to aim high. And uh, obviously there are a few of those around. But in general, I think we are definitely not in a golden age. There's just a lot of planning applications on the go at the moment. Well, that's an excellent base from which to uh, take the conversation a bit further forward, Rich. If all identified, need, more needs to be done, that we can do a lot better, quantity versus quality, um, and, and some uh, thoughts about social housing and procurement. I know that all of you, and us as well as an organisation, struggle with procurement, as I think the council does as well. Richard, can you start us off down that rabbit hole for a minute? Oh gosh, how long have I got? I get very hot under the collar about this actually. I mean, I mean, it's kind of ironic. I wish the Scottish government would stop lamely following what goes on in London and look to our continental friends instead and look to Finland or to, to Spain or to Portugal where there's a wholly different way of approaching how you commission architects and others to design buildings. Here, the whole thing is handed over to contractors, extraordinarily. I mean, the, the fox is in charge of the chickens here. And uh, ironically, what is happening more and more is that certain projects are only available to large uh, architects, uh, large firms of architects, who almost inevitably are based down in London. And so it's incredible the number of um, projects which are uh, uh, simply going south of the border because of the Scottish government's procurement procedures, which is amazing, really. Yeah. So I'm a great believer in, in paid, limited architectural competitions, not only because I think it's the best way of finding the best architect, but I also think it's very didactic. It very educates the people of Edinburgh who want to be part of the planning process to um, in, in the various possibilities for a site and I think that's very exciting and I like to get I liked it that the people should be with us in discussing the possibilities of how architecture might be and so I, I'm a great believer in that system there was a great competitions unit that Charles McKean set up at the RAS but unfortunately it was closed down and I'd like to think it could get revived and instead of doing two or three competitions a year I'd like to be two or 200 or 300 competitions for buildings not just in Edinburgh but all over Scotland would you Sorry. want to bring in? Would you want to bring in the floor, Adam, as well here? So, yeah. uh, Please do. Yeah, can we bring in the? Has everyone answered that that basic question though, in terms of the um, golden age? We've yeah. had some uh, some very clear thoughts from all of our guests on that one. So over to the floor then. <laughs> bring into some. So Barbara, Barbara has been monitoring the chat through the evening. So I'm going to bring her now in, just to maybe uh, share some quotes from people and ask a few questions. Are you on mute, Barbara? I will unmute, Barbara. Here we go. I am on mute. Um, we have had uh, quite a few questions in the chat. We also had some uh, earlier 
provided for us. So um, the first one was from Jocelyn Cunliffe, which was, do the existing planning controls provide sufficient protection of the unique skyline of the city? If so, why are clients and developers commissioning architects to design schemes that might have an adverse impact on the, uni on the unique skyline of the city? Okay, skyline. Give us a couple, come on. Um, there's one from um, uh, Stefano, which was asking what the speakers think that COVID-19 will impact upon the architecture of Edinburgh, um, for instance, in the density and circulation, ventilation, roads, and things like that. Any, any a last one, third one from the floor? Um, yeah, alongside that, I think Sarah Tolley is suggesting that it'd be good to have a new language of function as new buildings do look the same, um, irrespective of um, everything else. Um, and why, one, one question that we had, I think, from um, Lord Miller was, should the Botanic Gardens and Holyrood Park be included as part of the World Heritage Site? They're both right on the borders and very important sites in terms of heritage landscape and tourism as well. Okay, maybe we can give that one to Adam at some point if we have some time of it later. Maybe mm. just uh, address that question of um, COVID-19 and the, the current issue that we're having. Do, does anyone, maybe just one of you, if you have a, a, a particular point of view on the current situation, whether that will affect trends in architecture over the next few years? Well, if I could jump in on that one, I think that there is an enormous amount of talk around at the moment about let's not go back to where we were before it's a golden opportunity to rethink things a bit and of course that time ties in completely with the idea of a more sustainable future and so on so that whole thing about health and well-being and how we deal with food and how we deal with architecture and carbon they're all linked and so we have to find a way through to make a more sustainable city and the, of course the council has put out this objective recently of zero carbon by 2030 it's enormously difficult and so people need to understand what that means, not just a new building, but the old building stock as well. It has huge implications for transport. But that is a very worthwhile objective. And I can imagine the city getting behind that if they properly understood it, trying to find a way we could use our parks better in our streets and do more cycling, have better public transport, less use of the car and so on. So these things are, are completely interlinked. Maybe we could just pick up on that then, the, the combination of the, the new normal and the, the climate challenge that the city faces. Um, do, do Richard or Malcolm, do you have a, any thoughts on that? Yeah, yes. Um, it's a, a topsy-turvy time we're living in. Uh, there's, there's terrible things about COVID and we are by nature social animals. We need us around. We need to be looking people in the eye. We need to be hugging people. We need to be with people. The biggest killers in society are loneliness, lack of exercise, and overall overarching everything, inequality. And these are all diseases of social distancing and will be getting much worse. We need to get back to a place where we bring people together. And that's what architecture does. It's all about bringing people together. But there is a positive in what's happened in that. It's just fantastic out there in the city. You can hear the birdies sing. My eczema has gone because of the air quality and people have reclaimed the streets or walking up the middle of the road. Now that's because we don't have essential, inessential traffic on the road. Let's just say never have inessential traffic on the road. Greatly improved public transport, which I know has its issues in terms of mingling, but as I say, we need to get back to mingling. Make public transport free. That would be, that's what Luxembourg is doing. That's a fantastic innovation. Um, for people to think of the common good above all and that would benefit everyone in terms of their health in terms of their well-being we get the city walking we get the city cycling we get in essential traffic off our road so there's one positive thing to come out of this is that we can live without the traffic cho choking the, the street and indeed we can live much better without all that there's a good question there on the skyline it's something that's inscribed yes. as part of our world heritage site any thoughts from, from, from any of you, really, on the yes. section of the skyline? Richard? Yeah, I feel quite strongly about that. Um, uh, um, we do have a unique skyline, but that's not to say it's set in aspect for all time. And in general, there is a sort of generality of architecture, and then there are certain things that pierce the skyline, typically spires of churches and what have you. 
But that's not to say that, that we can't have new buildings pierce the skyline if they are if they are a appropriate and b uh, of architectural quality. And I I think there's there's some people who have a mentality that the the skyline should never ever be um, changed, and I I don't subscribe to that at all. There's there's an uh, extraordinary drawing which I think is by Geddes, and Geddes is a great hero. Uh, and we need to respect and understand them. But there's an extraordinary drawing of him showing how the dome of the North Brit of what was then North British Hotel, now the Balmoral, would block the view from Carlton Hill of uh, the Scott Monument. So therefore couldn't happen. But of course, if you stand in that spot, if you take two steps to the right, you can see past it to the Scott Monument and you understand that that dome enhances the view and doesn't detract from it. So there's a difference, as Richard says, between what enhances a view and what detracts from it. Nevertheless, the long views in Edinburgh are important. There are so many streets that are actually focused on the, the, the crown of St Giles or on the castle. Of course, these are old ancient routes in and it draws you into the city. But we have a tendency to over-prescribe these things as a, 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 a picture of the important views in Edinburgh, which is just basically uh, uh, covered covered in lines, so we overprescribe, and then we get bullied into setting them aside. We have strong planning guidelines, uh, as in the green belt, and all the time we get bullied into setting them aside. So I'm seeing a bit both. We need to enhance the skyline, but we also need to apply policy properly. Yeah, I, I, I I agree with that in principle, but I well remember the days back in I think it was the early 70s. I think I was a first or second year architecture student, and the first proposal was made for a tall building on the Haymarket site, which is a building just now starting to be developed. And people were unsure about it. They were very concerned about it. And the, the, uh, the groups who were opposing it erected a huge balloon. I think it was a barrage balloon, ex-army or something like that, up to the height of the building. And you could see it all over the city. And so there was a, a fantastic outcry. It wasn't given consent. And of course, the result was an empty site for 40 odd years, but there we go. It didn't happen. So that moment back in the early 70s, of deciding it was a low-rise city was immensely a good thing. And I think, that, yes, of course, there can be exceptions for the very best buildings, but most of the buildings that are pushing high these days are commercial buildings, and that's something I don't think you would like to see on the skyline. I think we're generally keeping below the radar unless it's something extremely special, and that's right. I'm interested in, in the questions around control and go back to Malcolm's point briefly there. Um, where, what do you all see then as the, the, the sort of the threat to Edinburgh's traditional buildings and, and its World Heritage Site? What do you see as the, the, the key threats there? Brad, do you want to kick us off into that one? Well, I, you know, the buildings that I've been involved with, I haven't found them threatened by anything other than the condition of the buildings. I know that might sound slightly glib, but um, when we took over the project at the University for the, Royal, the old Royal Infirmary building, it had been empty for uh, 12 years. The water was pouring through the roof. It was by that time full of rot. It was in a terrible state. And I'm told by our conservation advisor that the rainfall because of climate change has doubled in about 30 or 40 years in Scotland. It's having an, an enormously diff difficult and detrimental effect on some heritage buildings. So if the buildings are looked after, that's one thing. But if they're not, that's, that's a bigger threat to the heritage and almost anything else. I think the general skyline and the, which buildings are listed and should be protected, that's well written up. But the condition of buildings is a, is a big worry. Richard, what about yourself? Uh, well, I think there are two sides to the question. One is um, you know, the existing historic building stock. And to be honest, you lot have done a really good job. Um, you know, uh, 30 or 40 years ago, uh, the, a lot of uh, Edinburgh's, um, well, it wasn't even a World Heritage Site in those days, but uh, was in a pretty poor state. And uh, now it's in a much, much better state, both in the old town and the new town. So well done. World Heritage Organization. When we talk about Edinburgh, though, the problem is how do you how do you match the quality of what we have with with new work? And that's the critical thing. It seems to me is that it's not an easy place to build in Edinburgh. I know that for, for my cost, but you you have to first of all strive to make the new new work of the highest quality. It seems to me, and then you have to start thinking to yourself, how do I get the highest quality work in Edinburgh? And that seems to be coming back to the whole issue of procurement. So I, I worry that the, the biggest problem, it seems to me, with history is to either mimic it 
ape it or to sort of pretend that you're not there. And that is a sort of, that is a creeping disease that spreads over the city like cancer or something. And you sometimes find there are whole streets made of incredibly bland buildings that I call them stealth projects, buildings that are trying not to be there, but are there and uh, trying not to draw attention to themselves. And I, I just find that too depressing for, 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 to even describe, I'm afraid. So you see it as more of a continuity rather than as a denial of what's been before or a, or a, or a, or a copy of what's been before. Absolutely. I, I never copy. Never copy. Malcolm, what about so, you in terms of the... Except Carpa, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm looking at the question, I'm thinking, Two threats to uh, Edinburgh's Her World Heritage Site. First of all, people are the lifeblood of place. So in the 1980s, I worked with Rob Hunter and Nick Grosrains, Rains, and we built the first new housing in the old town for decades and decades and decades. The place was a desert at that time. And I felt really, really good when I felt I was bringing people back into the old town, into the into World Heritage Site. Now I went to see a friend who's in one of the one of the one of those developments, and they are basically almost the last residents there. The whole of the rest of the block mm. is uh, um, Airbnb, and you know it's great. It's wonderful that people want to come to our city, I and mean, we need to value their friendship. We need to value that. You economic input they bring to it but we need to we need to have that balance you cannot welcome people in if there's no one there to welcome them if people come here they want to know that there's edinburgh people living here too and the balance is skewed and we need to bring in tourist tax transient visitor tax it's called we need to be able to control airbnb with planning and we need to build social housing, not just in, this, in the outskirts and suburbs, but back in the centre of the city. You look at View Craigs and Dumby Dykes, these are really, really key important places. We still have Edinburgh people living in council estates in these places. And the, the glory of Edinburgh and the Enlightenment grew out the social classes mixed on top of each other, rubbing against each other. And we lose that historic Edinburgh creativity if we just pull back from the centre of the city. I was at a, um, a, a conference about tourism in Edinburgh and the uh, it, Scottish tourist chiefs were almost demanding that I move out my house um, out of the city and give it up to the tourist industry. And I also worry that the heritage community is being drawn into a situation where it's a branch of the tourist industry and we need to be very careful to resist that. Of course, these are all things that will change post-COVID. People aren't going to move about as much and the Edinburgh economy will need to adjust and maybe that's a necessary adjustment that Edinburgh will need to take. So more people, more Edinburgh people uh, living here, committed to the place full time in here to balance the welcome that we give to visitors. Thank you, Malcolm. I um, hope everyone's enjoying the conversation. Um, at this point, just to remind you that if you'd like to support our conservation work, the protection of the World Heritage Site, the conservation of the buildings and protecting local communities. You can donate via text. Um, so please, um, if you could text Edinburgh WH with the amount you want to donate to 70450. So that's Ed Edinburgh WH, then the amount you want to donate to 70450. We are seeing a significant gap in our, in our, re our revenue this year and we really appreciate your support. So having said that, next question, we're all running out of time a little bit. Hopefully we can go for another 10 minutes, people can stay with us. Um, one question we were asked um, to put to the panel was really, and it's a little bit unfair, what's your least favorite building in the city and why? So we'll, we'll start with Richard on this one. Uh, I don't like the question because I like to keep positive, uh, but since you mentioned it in my career here in Edinburgh, I suppose there is one building which I rec represents to me the Nadir, and that's what used to be called the Scandic Crown Hotel, by a lovely man, Ian Begg, who's a, a delightful man and a friend, but I didn't agree at all with his approach to architecture because it, it, it tried to be something, it tried to just be completely false. And at the same time, it represented a major new hotel on the Royal Mile, and it was a fantastic wasted opportunity to say what we could do today rather than make a, a sort of sham version of something medieval. And I, I, get, I got very angry about that building. 
Uh, but actually, in a funny sort of way, it was a kind of turning point because I think some people in the planning department realized that it was a kind of architectural cul-de-sac and not the way you go about building in the, in a historic city center. But um, so that's my, that's my example for you. Brad, what are, what are your thoughts? Uh, I, I can't use this agenda center anymore. It's gone. But I thought of another one, which is almost directly opposite the College of Art in Morrison Place is the Blood Transfusion Center which was built when I was a student and they demolished a very fine terrace of houses to build it. It is an absolutely ghastly building, quite large, very deep in plan, set back from the street, big vehicle bays at the back and all the rest of it. Surely something could be done with it, either reclad it, remodel it, or do something in the future. But it looks like the missing link of what could be a very fine row of buildings when everything is complete along there. And then there's eventually a lead from, you know, Bristol Square to Fountain Bridge or whatever. That could be the missing link that makes it all join together. Malcolm, any thoughts from you? And it, it's bet, uh, uh, to be positive about it, it is a health facility where we need a health facility in the middle of the city. The moving out of the Royal Infirmary from where it's accessible and where it looks out onto the trees of the meadows uh, out to the ring road and the sea of car parking is one of the biggest disasters that has befallen Edinburgh. My um, least favorite building is actually probably thousands of buildings and just last week, Edinburgh's Garden District was granted planning permission to um, thrash the brand of Edinburgh um, against all planning conditions, against all policy after 10 years of bullying, diddy box suburbs spread out across the green belt to the west under a system which, and this is as Winston Churchill points out, this current land value system means that the value of the land which should accrue to the public um, goes to what he's called the evils of the land monopolist who skims all the cream which should be for the public benefit. We need, as in Germany and other places, a land value capture which can ensure we build these places properly, we can plan them properly and that instead of going offshore into tax havens, uh, the profit made out that land is used to build good schools, good transportation and um, public housing on part of the land rather than allow uh, land monopolists and private house builders to take uh, help to buy subsidy, which raises the price, which goes straight into their bonuses and the price of homes and makes them unaffordable to all but the small minority that, that can get a big diddy box in the suburbs. We need to revitalize the shore first, New Haven, all those places, the empty sites in the central cities, connect them better, build the tram, invest in that. Uh, there was a, a, I've been involved in a calculation that said there's, I think, nearly 10 billion to be released in the next 20 years in the land value in, in Scotland. In Edinburgh alone, we need to get the a leverage into place to make sure that, that, that we can, the public can skim the cream of that. Thank you. Barbara, back to you. Any more questions coming in from the floor, that burning questions that would like um, answered? We've, um, we've got a couple. Um, uh, you probably touched on some of them anyway. Um, one of them was from OJ Garden, which was to, to RAB, which is how can we deliver a positive experience as for Amsterdam to planning on the Edinburgh World Heritage Site? Um, you know, probably covered a lot of that already. Um, and then there's um, one which is probably the opposite of the one you've just answered, which is um, uh, what would be a dream project in Edinburgh for any of the architects and where would they put it? <laughs> okay, Brad, you want to start with that? Well, my personal obsession at the moment is to ask why Edinburgh doesn't have an architecture center. It's nothing to do with a building that I might design, but uh, you know, Amsterdam's got one, Copenhagen's got one, Hamburg's got one, London, of course, so that's a very different place, Paris, Milan, you know, all kinds of places have got this forum for discussion and debate which can move architecture forwards, but not Edinburgh. And it, if I can help that get that off the ground, I'd be absolutely delighted. So that would be my vision for the moment. Richard? Yeah, well, I agree entirely with what Rab said. I mean, you know, as Gladstone said, we must educate our masters and we want to bring the public along in a great big discussion about architecture and show what's possible. So I think it's a great idea to have an architecture centre and I'm, I hope his uh, committee at the RAS is successful there. Um, 
I've forgotten the first part of your question. What was it again? <laughs> An ideal project. Ideal project. Yes. Well, actually, it's, it's kind of a funny, a funny turn of events has has happened in a way because for a long time I used to think that I was condemned to building in news lanes and back gardens and down little closes and never on a front street. And I always dreamt that one day I would get to build a public building in Edinburgh because I'd been building them in I don't know Dunfermline and Dundee and Perth and Peebles and Carnarvon and Galway, but not in Edinburgh. And blow me if we've got this job now to build the film house in Festival Square. So suddenly I've gone from one extreme to the other, and making an extremely prominent uh, contemporary public building. And I, I hope that one succeeds and, and gets built. But it's we're at the beginning of a long process. So I'm, I'm quite satisfied at the moment doing that project. And all the film lovers are, are fingers crossed for you. <laughs> and uh, Malcolm. I've been involved in... Um, political changes that have got the community and parliament bill through in Scotland and the opportunities for community asset transfers and other development. We've talked about leadership, but there is a little bit of optimism in Scotland that um, communities can use new levers to develop themselves. And I'd love to be involved in a housing project where communities take the lead. Uh, because when people do things themselves, they do them so much better. Look at John Kinsley's Bath Street co-op development down in Portobello, the best new housing in Scotland uh, in the last 20 years. Um, when people lead themselves as they have done there, and when local authorities are able to give them access to land and public authorities to opportunities, I think that could be a big change. And there are a number of architects and uh, new practices who are of course frustrated by what uh, Richard and Rab point out are the barriers to um, uh, involvement, who are who are working with communities and doing good work there, and I'm I'm doing that too. My Bridge End Farmhouse project, which was one of <laughs> the community urban asset transfers, just last week delivered its ten thousand free good meal to the vulnerable of the Inch and Craig Miller, and that's a fantastic resource and fantastic work an organisation like that are doing. And I used to have people laugh at me because I was, I cared about community architecture and that was wrong for an architect not to be wanting to do big art centres and things. I've done these things too, but I think that there's a real, a golden seam to go back to your title, to be followed in terms of the empowerment of people and access to development money and buildings within their own places, their own neighbourhoods. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much indeed. These have been absolutely fabulous answers and a wonderful debate and um, I wish we had time for more. I feel we could probably talk for the next four or five hours on this subject but we've, we've, we've promised to limit ourselves to around about an hour this evening and, and we, are, we are now at that point. So before Nick gives you a final sales pitch to encourage you to donate to Edinburgh World Heritage rather than having not paid for tickets as uh, the event was free this evening, and really, we do need every penny we can get at the moment to support our work connecting people to their heritage. Um, I have the pleasure of uh, thanking our, our wonderful speakers who have spoken with reason, passion and intellectual depth this evening. Um, not that I doubted for a minute that they would. But I'm also one delighted by the, the amazing audience we've had. We have people here from Istanbul, from Milan, from Poland, from Copenhagen listening in, as well as a lot of passionate Edinburgh people who care so deeply about their city. I think that the conclusion is that we're perhaps not in a golden age uh, at the moment, but that we could be in a golden age. To get there, there's a need for leadership and vision, um, but not of the sort that, as one commentator put it, drives a motorway through the city centre. We need the right kind of leadership, whether that's in the form of an elected law provost um, or in the form of an architecture centre where debate and vision can be formed is a question for another day perhaps. And perhaps the elected mayor question is not one for a heritage body to be dwelling on too deeply. But I think in amongst this, the, there are opportunities to get us into this golden age, opportunities to rethink, particularly at the moment, whether it's our public spaces, whether it's VAT on the repair of historic buildings, whether it's how we get the quality in our new buildings that matches what we already have. There's the question to think about styles. Rab brought up that wonderful idea of moving from the international style to a local style, that movement which happened 
uh, throughout the, in the 19th century, um, from classical to the Scots baronial, as you walk down Coburn Street in that amazing fantasy which has been built there. Malcolm made a really important point about the opportunities of people and place to re-inhabit the old town, uh, to sort out the Airbnb situation. And in that point, I would point you all to the local plan, the city plan, the 2030 plan. That is the most important document that is coming forward about the shape of this city in the future. And if every single person here this evening engaged with that deeply, then we can get some really good tools and get the planners planning again, as Richard said, absolutely vital. So all of these things are ways that can get us to the future, to a brighter future. I'm immensely grateful to our, our speakers for their time and energy tonight, for putting themselves up in front of an enormous number of people to, to discuss the future of this city and its past as well. And on this point, I'm going to hand over to Nick for our final note. Of the evening. Thank you, Adam. So we've just celebrated as a charity, um, um, the starting of 1500 projects in Edinburgh and 20 years as a conservation charity. And we are funded partly by Historic Scotland, but we do rely on the donations of individuals. In fact, the conservation of the city of Edinburgh is really a function of the generosity <coughs> of individuals over the years, um, for many hundreds of years. So please consider giving to us tonight. Um, as a reminder, you can text to Edinburgh WH with the amount you want to donate. Um, 70450 is the number. 70450 and uh, write Edinburgh WH with the amount you want to donate. You can also become a member by going to Edinburgh World Heritage, um, uh, ewh.org.uk slash members. Just time to mention that our next event will hopefully be in two weeks time. We'll send you an email confirmation of that. And the subject is how can we build a better Edinburgh? And we've invited a group of politicians um, to have that conversation with us. Edinburgh is experiencing an unprecedented degree of change in planning, transport, tourism, and the local economy. How will the coronavirus outbreak change this? And in this conversation, um, we'll be joined by three leading politicians, including the city leader, Adam McVeigh. <clears throat> and we will ask the question, how can we make our capital city a better place in which to live and work after the coronavirus? So we look forward to seeing you all at that event and maybe some other people too. And until then, good night and thank you. Thank you so much. Sure, yeah.